This is Mexico. And at this to begin with scenes like these, because these are the colorful things that steal the eye. The first impressions of a country known to the artist and the tourist as a paradise on earth. Life here is often described as slow and easy, but this is not a visionary story of beauty and color, but a realistic effort to set down some hard facts of Mexican life and to trace a project that is dealing with these facts. That's why we go now from the snow-capped mountains to the hard work land below. Here no tractor roars, but an oxen team slowly follows an overworked soil. Mexico has been called a land naturally rich and economically poor, but this statement is just not true. Half of Mexico's land is too mountainous for agriculture, and much of the remainder is too dry or is suitable only for grazing. Only 7% of her land, and that found largely in flat mountain valleys, is good for agriculture. Much of this land has been overcropped. It has been planted continuously to corn year after year for centuries. Never rested and never revitalized with fertilizer or fertility restoring crops, it has become exhausted. Without new strains of corn, her story has become one of dwindling harvests. Thin, stony soil has been eaten by the cancer of erosion. The Mexican farmer takes on a hard task when he tries to raise his crop of corn or beans from this poor land. His varieties of seed have not improved, and his corn in some cases, like this primitive brown-seeded popcorn, is still the same corn which his ancestors grew centuries ago. It is small and primitive, and the end result is low production and insufficient food resources. There is little variety in the average Mexican diet, mainly corn, beans, and chili peppers. Beans cooked to a paste and corn ground into tortillas, supplemented and seasoned with fearfully hot but vitamin-rich chili peppers, provide the staple food of the people. The average Mexican worker consumes up to 40 tortillas each day. In sufficient quantities, it is a nutritionally sufficient diet, but for over 30 years, there was in no year enough corn. The Mexican woman's ingenuity is to be praised because from a normally poor bread-making cereal, she has found the way to prepare a satisfactory and valuable bread. Patiently, the Mexican wife grinds the corn in a seemingly endless task. With the moist flour, she makes a mound of dough, and the bigger the mound, the happier she is, for this means food and many tortillas to fill hungry mouths. With swift, deft movements of her hands, she flaps the dough into thin pancakes, which she bakes over an open fire. These, with beans and chili, will provide the monotonous meal, little varied from day to day. But this sad lack of variety, strangely enough, offers a point of hope. For anyone who can increase the yield of corn and beans and improve their nutritional quality has struck at the heart of Mexico's food problem. Plenty for the Mexican means first, more and better corn and beans. Then if wheat with its valuable protein as a next step can be added to the diet in plentiful enough quantity, a great step forward will have been taken. Being traditionally a single crop country, Mexico offers a special opportunity for experiment. Here, problems of nutrition, diet, and public health can be successfully attacked initially by increasing the country's corn output. With sufficient corn, Mexico would be well on the road to health and well-being for her people. Improvement in agriculture is the key to Mexico's nutrition problems. It was with this in mind that the Rockefeller Foundation decided to participate in an experiment to revitalize a Mexican agriculture. In 1941, the Foundation decided to examine the question and arrived at the conclusion that U.S. scientific personnel and a small amount of U.S. finance could help Mexico solve her agricultural problem. If Mexico could import knowledge and experience, it might be possible to create new fertility and add to the richness and well-being of the land. So money was appropriated from the Rockefeller funds, personnel recruited, and in 1943, laboratories were set up at San Jacinto in Mexico City and an experiment station at Chapingo, where a staff of Americans working hand in hand with Mexican students prepared to carry out a program of recovery for Mexican agriculture. From the first, the background of basic research was created. A library was assembled at San Jacinto so that students could have access to the recorded experience of those who had worked in this field in all parts of the world. Here was made available the records of experiments in soil chemistry, the data of entomology, the evidence of the plant pathologist, and the experience of the agronomist, along with the observations of the nutritionist. And a program of extensive collection was established. 
Specimens of plants and pests were identified, classified, and cataloged. Diseases and insects and their host plants were studied. The evidence on which the experiments were to proceed was being assembled, but this was also an experiment with people. At every stage, Mexicans worked side by side with Americans, for to the Mexicans would one day fall the whole task of seeing the work through. Theirs will be the charge to maintain plenty in Mexico, and so they learn of the new methods and how to apply them to the improvement of Mexican agriculture. Corn varieties were collected from all parts of Mexico, more than 1,800 collections in all, so that the best which already existed could be the subject of experiments and development. The seeds were carefully prepared, classified, and packeted. Detailed records were kept of where they were to be sown. Carefully prepared by hand to avoid mixing, they were later shipped to different parts of the country to be grown under the varying conditions which soil and climate offered. And so the ground was broken and the seed corn was sown by hand carefully to assure accuracy and to keep varieties from becoming mixed. Patience and thoroughness characterized this stage of the work. The primary object was to see how these different varieties, prolific and disease resistant in their native habitat, would fare in their new surroundings. This preliminary testing was to provide a basis for selecting a few good varieties for seed increase. From these fields came the first varieties which were soon to be released to Mexican farmers for planting and which also were to be used as foundation stock for breeding new kinds of corn. Corn reproduces itself by wind pollination. The tassel and the silk represent the male and female elements. Pollen dust from the male tassel falls onto the female silk, which hangs from the embryo ear and fertilization takes place. Here we see the pollen being deliberately introduced from the tassel to the silk to illustrate what happens in nature. As the planted corn sprouts and grows, the fields are filled with green standing corn. And if left to itself, the wind would accomplish the process of pollination. Pollen dust from the ripe tassels would be wind-borne to the ready silks. But if left to the devices of nature, no control could be maintained. So the tassel is carefully covered with a paper sack to prevent the dispersal of the pollen. Similarly, each embryo ear and its silk is protected. In this way, promiscuous pollination is prevented. As the corn ripens, the pollen from the tassel is shaken into its protective bag, and this is then transferred to the silk. At harvest time, there are some tall, strong, prolific plants, and there are some stunted, weak, poorly yielding ones which are poorly adapted to this climate and soil. The task now is to concentrate on the plants of good yield which show strength and resistance to disease. Here is one good, healthy ear from a variety coming from the Bajio, Mexico's corn belt. This slender-eared corn, known as tabloncillo, is one of the best varieties and comes from Jalisco. The Mexican farmer is partial to peptilla, a type with long, slender kernels, especially fine for tortilla making. Continued inbreeding has reduced the vigor of this plant until it produces only a small head, but it is still valuable for breeding purposes and will be so used. Such unpromising inbred strains, when crossed, produce a vigorous hybrid with large productive ears, such as this successful specimen. And so the harvesting goes on. This is done carefully by hand so that the chosen ears can be traced back to their seed types at the station in Chapingo. The yield will be sown again as seed, and the whole process repeated many times until a healthy, prolific, disease-resistant hybrid corn is available in quantities sufficiently plentiful to permit of commercial development. Crossing is done by hand pollinating in experimental plots. But to produce hybrid corn commercially, the two kinds to be crossed are planted in alternate plots in the same field. Tassels of one kind are removed before pollen is shed. Wind and nature do the rest. All of the seed on the detasseled plants is hybrid seed. To assure a continuing flow of better and better varieties, the basic research must go on. So back in Chapingo, the cataloging of the new crop proceeds in preparation for next year's experiment.
Similar methods of control breeding are used to develop new disease-resistant varieties of wheat, an old-world cereal which is becoming increasingly important in Mexico. New strong strains are required to prosper in the Mexican climate. In the case of wheat, control pollination is achieved by removing the pollen-producing anthers of one plant and transferring to it the anthers of another plant. Here we see a head of wheat being emasculated several days before it is ready to flower. Carefully, the anthers are removed, three from each flower. The operator counts the anthers to make sure none is missed. The operator now has a prepared spike ready for hybridization. He bags it until the female organs have matured. After three days, the bag is removed, and a flowering spike is brought from another variety, chosen as the pollen-giving parent of the cross. The anthers are removed from this other head and made ready for insertion in the emasculated flowers. One by one, the anthers are placed in the emasculated flowers, and cross-pollination has thus been affected. The result, if the experiment succeeds, will be a hybrid wheat of improved quality and quantity. To protect the new pollinated spike, the operator replaces the paper bag and thus prevents any wind pollen from reaching the plant. In this way, he guarantees accuracy for his experiment and the tag records his data. The first generation hybrid wheat is vigorous and productive, but does not breed true. Many selections are made from it and these must be carefully grown through several generations and reselected before a stable variety which will reproduce itself is evolved. And this in time must be bred through many generations to achieve commercial increase. In the breeding process, the product of a single plant becomes a row of wheat in the next generation. The rows of wheat are harvested by hand to prevent the possibility of error from grains becoming mixed. Each row, when harvested, is carefully tabbed and laid out to await threshing. Threshing is done, and winnowing of these small quantities is done by hand to secure accuracy, and careful records are kept. Each sample is kept separate for purposes of recognition and classification. At Chipingo, the samples are cataloged and recorded and classified for further study. From here, the new seed will go out for planting and gradually will be multiplied. As the process of purification goes on, each generation produces a greater quantity of seed. And as the operation grows in scale, handwork gives way to mechanical methods. The chief virtue of new varieties developed in this program is their resistance to disease, especially to rust. These new types can be grown not only in winter, but in the summer rainy season. Within six years of the beginning of the program, some 4,500 tons of wheat were ready for planting. This seeded over 100,000 acres, or about 8% of the total wheat acreage of Mexico. In the seventh year, there was improved wheat to seed 75% of the wheat acreage. In these large fields, a stable new variety is being grown for commercial increase. While these plant experiments go on, the soil chemist in the laboratory is experimenting with fertilizers to improve the impoverished soil. One experimental technique of obtaining accurate distribution is to mix and press the fertilizers into briquettes. This corn is being grown under controlled conditions of fertilization, and the varying results are clearly seen as the skyline of standing corn traces its graph against the clouds. Different types and quantities of fertilizers have been used with varying proportions of the three important fertilizer elements, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Some plants have tall, luxuriant, healthy foliage. Others are stunted and sparsely leaved. As a result of these experiments, improved fertilizer formulae are developed. Another method of improving the soil is through the use of green manure crops. Annual sweet clover sown between the rows of corn at the last cultivation chokes out weeds and gathers soil-enriching nitrogen from the air. The roots bear nodules containing nitrogen-fixing bacteria. In the spring, sweet clover is turned under to add organic matter to the soil. A major obstacle to Mexican agriculture 
is a variety of plant diseases, and a continual effort must be made to produce healthy plants free of disease and resistant to infection. Here, a laboratory worker is testing a bean plant for resistance to anthracnose disease. She inoculates several plants by spraying with a suspension of disease-causing spores and places them in a cabinet with controlled temperature and humidity. Disease-resistant plants will defy the infection. Others will be susceptible. After a time, the plants are examined. Here is a plant which has succumbed to the infection. Here is a healthy, disease-resistant plant. Here in the field, corn is being tested for its resistance to fusarium rot. A toothpick infected with fusarium is stuck in the corn stalk. Later, the stalk is cut open, and the extent of the spread of the rot reveals whether the plant is resistant or susceptible. Other principal enemies of the Mexican farmer are insect pests. Good seed and good land are not enough. Constant vigilance to rid the crops of pests and prevent their increase must be practiced. Sometimes insects and diseases combine to produce destruction. Here, leaf hoppers, which spread the stunt disease of corn, are placed on corn seedlings. Ecological field work provides specimens and data for research into the incidence of pests. And as a result of this research, steady progress in the fight to eliminate pests is achieved. The wriggling grubs are the larvae of a stalk borer. A high yield is in the end dependent on a full understanding and effective control of disease and insects. Detailed study of both plant and insect is necessary before an effective insecticide can be evolved. Corn is the object of attack from the fall army worm. And again, healthy plants and improved soil do not guarantee a plentiful yield if the ravages of this marching insect go unchecked. Laboratory workers pursue the work of identification and classification. What is learned in the laboratory is applied in the field. After new insecticides are evolved, they are tested under controlled conditions to ascertain quantities and strengths and to establish treatment schedules. At first, only small areas are employed as testing grounds and hand equipment is used. A worker with a hand-operated duster goes along the rows. The effect of the insecticide will be closely watched and a treatment schedule will be arrived at. Proper treatment will protect the crops and prevent insect injuries like these. producing healthy plants like this one. When formulae and schedules have been worked out, the insecticide is applied in gross quantities to large areas by mechanical dusters. In this way, whole crops can be treated and a high degree of protection achieved. Although some pests cannot be eradicated completely, they can be brought under control and the degree of damage greatly reduced and a consequent higher yield secured. Gradually, the experiment bears fruit. But the improvement is not only in the land and the crops, even more it is in the native skill and knowledge of the Mexicans. This lasting contribution of the experiment is the ultimate objective. For the Mexican farmer, despite his respect for tradition, is not hard to convince once he sees a definite result. He is becoming interested in new methods and new crops such as sorghum, a drought-resistant cereal which is very productive in the drier parts of Mexico. Through the training program, the Mexicans themselves are learning to do all the jobs learning to conduct the research, to apply it in the field, learning to teach the new knowledge and the new methods to their own farmers. For the first time since 1912, Mexico has produced enough corn to meet her needs. Now, after only six years of work, there is significant improvement in Mexico. In the marketplace, the traditional corn and beans are more plentiful. The Mexican housewife shops better, and her children will eat better. And for all, there is greater hope on the horizon. Only a start has been made, but Mexico is working towards a goal of plenty. Now, for the first time since 1912, she has enough corn for the needs of her people. Now, she has sufficient to allow an increase in the number of her livestock. The experiment station at Chipingo integrates the laboratory and the land.
Much is still to be done, but already Mexico, in joint effort with her neighbor in the north, is conquering waste due to disease, is bringing good heart back into her land, is creating a vision of plenty in the minds of her people. <laughs>